You are now listening to Shotgun Sports USA. I'm your host, Justin Barker, and I talk to shotgun shooters from all disciplines, championship-winning coaches, gun clubs, world-class target setters, vendors, and industry-leading companies that fuel the sport. If you're into clay target sports, you are at the right place for insider information from some of the best in the world every single week. Check us out online at ShotgunSportsUSA.com and like us on Facebook and Instagram. Shotgun Sports USA is powered by Winchester Ammunition, the American legend. Also brought to you by Ultimate Shooting Accessories, Rick Hemingway's Promatic Trap Cells, Sound Gear, Sound Gear Fanel, Comp and Choke, Clay Shooter Supply, Peel of Performance Eyewear, and Clay Target Vision. My guest on the show today is a world championship level target setter. He has set several world championship courses, including the World English, World Feed Task, World Compact, Beretta World, and British Open. He's one of eight official course designers for Feed Task and joined the EJ Churchill team in 2020. Please welcome to the show, Jamie Peckham. Jamie, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Justin. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I've had some great target setters on this show for sure, but I don't think that I've had a target setter on the show that has been involved with setting as many world championships as you have. So for the people listening, name some of those large tournaments that you've set targets for. I've done uh, the, I've done World Englishes at EJ Churchill's. I've done World Englishes at my father's old ground at Southdale. Uh, world Fit Ash in Providence Hill Farm in 2020. Uh, world Fit Ash in Minnesota Horse and Hunt in 2005. Uh, sorry, 2006. Uh, Southern Counties was in 2005 in the UK, and I did that was then the World English in t- 2000 and 2002. And you've also set a bunch of other huge tournaments as well, not just world championships. I've traveled around the world doing quite a lot of competitions. Where Where are you from? You from? Uh, you sound like you're from Kansas. No, I'm from, from Sussex, <laughs> uh, just south of London. Okay, and you, and you're a part of the EJ Churchill team. So, what do you do there? Uh, basically, I look after two shooting grounds for EJ Churchill's and all their outside events. Okay, we do a lot of shoots at big, big, uh, big estates all around the country. Well, you've got a pretty neat s- start into this sport. Tell me how you got started in this. My father used to take me rough shooting, <clears throat> a bit like your walk up shooting in mm-hmm. England. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I was seven years old, and then we started. He started clay shooting when I was about ten, and then in, then we started running a shoot our own shoots when I was about twelve years old. So basically, I've been brought up with it all my life. Yeah, how did he get into it? How did he make the and your and for the people listening, your dad's got a big name in this sport. How did he get into it and make that name for himself? Well, we we were doing smaller shoots in Sussex, and then one day we managed to get a, a bit of ground, and we started South Down Sporting Gun Club, okay. and then that grew, and he got a reputation, and it went on from there. <clears throat> well, so give me some of his background, like what he was known for doing. Well, he was, uh, we used to do a lot of registered shoots and uh, they become quite, all the top shots used to come on a Sunday and it was like a sort of a world championships with, we had George Digweed, Richard Folds, Doug Vine, uh, Mark Windsor, name a few every weekend at the, at the shooting ground. So if you won there, you, you beat the best. Yeah, that's neat that uh, you had that, that many big names in one place. You know, I don't know about Doug Vine, but uh, all the rest of them, yeah, for sure. And I'm yeah. just picking on Doug. But yeah. so no, Doug, Doug could shoot when he was over in the UK. He was up there with them. So by working with your dad, I'm assuming that this helped propel your career into what you're doing now. Yes, it did, yeah. What is it that you do? What is your job other than EJ Churchill? What do you do? I, I do I'm an official Fitash course designer. So I get to do uh, i work quite closely with john francois palancas and uh i get to do the world and european uh, sporting championships and and i get to do the compacts as well i did the world compact in cyprus last year which uh, which proved was a good really good success so are you the only course designer there's a, there's eight of us all together but there's probably three or four that are active 
the other four are sort of uh, red. Jo- John Woolley is one as well, but he he doesn't do any shoots anymore. So what what's involved with this? When they have a shoot come up, they call one of you to go design the course for them? Yeah, that's correct. So basically, uh, we get asked about a year in advance if we're available and we want to do it. And then, uh, say, about six months before the shoot, we go over and mark out all the shooting positions and the, uh, the layouts where we want them and safety and uh, the, all the, the, the infrastructure. And then uh, about three weeks before the competition, we go over there and with the machines and start installing them and uh, building the eight layouts. So you are, So if you design it, you're basically going to set the course as well? Yes, yeah. that's correct, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, well, when we were over there six months before, we choose the machines we want and basically mark out where we want them. So we got a, a, a plan going into into it beforehand. Yeah. Well, you've been known to build and design courses for, I mean, in different countries everywhere. So give me some examples of where you've been and maybe some of the courses you design. Uh, I've done shoots in Thailand, in Kuwait, uh, Finland, uh, France. Uh, I've done in sh- a few shoots in America. Uh, I've, I've built some shooting grounds as well in many different countries. I've built one in Uruguay. I've built one in Greece. Uh, so yeah, it's been I've been around a lot of these different. <laughs> shoots. It's, it's, it sa- it's, sounds I've, like it. Yeah, I've got a lot of ideas. Good traveling, you get a lot of ideas and uh, seeing how each each country does it differently, and you get get their ideas. That's what I was going to, my very next question was how, how do they do it differently? How does Greece do it differently from the U S or the UK? Uh, it's, it's a different style of targets, really. It's more like that, what you hunt and say, say in Cyprus, they do a lot of uh, partridge shooting in the mountains. So there's targets coming down off big cliffs at, at speed. Uh, you're shooting more like walked up. It's your upland shooting. So it's a lot of going away stuff in the UK. We do a lot of driven. So it's more stuff coming at us and pigeon shooting. So it's stuff more coming towards you. So it's just different styles of basically a form of hunting, and that's where you get your ideas from. Have you seen the blade frame that Pila made exclusively for clay target vision? They had Pila design this because they've always felt that the outlaws needed a frame that's simple, light, and just works. Clay Target Vision has been selling Pila glasses for 20 years, and they understand the product and can get you into Pilas that work for you. Check out this special. Get a blade frame set with one lens for $389 and free shipping. And you can choose any lens, even the newest lenses for 2022. Place your order at claytargetvision.com. Where are the biggest shooting grounds located? I'm assuming the U.S. Yes, they are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, there's, a, there's a big one I went to in Kuwait. That's the Olympic one. And that, that's quite an impressive place. The, the difference in size I'm sure has something to do with what style targets you can throw. Oh uh, yeah, that's if, if you've got plenty of space, you should sh- throw some good crosses. And uh, if it's a bit narrow, you have to so so what the terrain ha- lets you work with. Yeah. All right. So you didn't just design courses in different countries. You've also helped Promatic with the design of some of their traps. Am I am I right when I say that? Yes. Yeah, so my colleague Monty, we we traveled around. We we did a lot of shoot support for the, for the world and European championships. And we, we traveled a lot together. And when we were doing shoots, we, we, we used to discuss how we, we could make the traps better. Then Monty went back to the factory and, and, uh, made basically the matrix. We, we did, it was the Ranger and we upgraded it and we developed the, the matrix. It's called in the UK, it's called the Falcon, but we've come up with all the ideas to make it a better machine. It, can you explain that? How do you say, I mean, what, what do you do to make a machine better? Well, uh, we've lo- we lowered the top plate. So you, the trap, the clays don't fall out the side and we don't get any bounce going over the back rail. Uh, we added features like a front finger and some stops. So you could really lean the trap over and throw it downhill. Uh, and, uh, we made the frame thicker as well. So you can put bigger, so it didn't vibrate so much. But what do you do differently? to set clays in the UK versus setting in the, in the U S because I know the clays are different sizes. So what kind of, what do you do differently? Uh, it's just basically trying to get your trap positions in different places. I find it, trap, trap positioning is critical. You've got to get your trap in the right place. And, uh, with your clays, they seem to slow down a bit quicker. 
Right. So maybe just bring the traps in slightly closer, and you, you don't try. I ne- don't try to ask too much of the trap. I never wind a trap fully up with with spring in case the wind changes direction or uh, you 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 know, you've got yourself in in a situation you can add spring to get yourself out of it situations. The targets being bigger in the UK. Do you ever shoot US targets over in the UK? Uh, no, we don't. No, we we we've just got. We, we, it's, it's cha- it has changed a bit in the UK we've, because we've gone over to eco clays, so the traps don't can't handle the spring like the, the previous clays did, and so with it, they're a bit more becoming like the US style of clay. So you can't we haven't got, we can't really use the double spring anymore because they just break clays. They just clays just handle the power. So the traps in the US have one spring, correct? Yeah, the traps, or you've got three different springs. You've got your trainer spring, a skeet spring, and a normal trap spring. In the UK, we'd have the double spring as well, but we can't use it as much now with these new eco clays. Now, who makes the eco clay? Uh, you've got uh, Laporte and you've got Euro Target, and uh, okay. CCI have just bought out a new eco clay as well. Okay, so the the, the clays are harder, right? So you can yeah. so you can just throw them faster. I guess that's. They're a little bit more air. They haven't got such a high dome as your clays. They're a bit more flatter, so they cut through the air a bit, bit, and they so they don't they don't lose their speed as much. They carry the speed on. Yeah, yeah. I've never shot them, but I want to. I want to try them out and see what it's like. So uh, the, your, the middies here slow up. They haven't seen, They don't seem to have the weight either. So they seem to slow a lot quicker. I, when I've used the the middies in this country, I can't seem to get the distance. Right. So they they slow up really quick. The middies do. Yeah, I'll be, noticeably, yes, they do. Yeah. I got a question about setting a course. How do you strike the balance to satisfy the classes when setting targets so that you don't have seven one hundred straights and then your D class is shooting a forty two? How do you how do you set a course to where it's it's not that spread out? Uh, I, I try if I'm putting a hard target on. I, I may I put it with an easier target, and uh, so uh, if they don't come off the stand with fifty percent. Uh, that's all. Sorry, they come off the stand with fifty percent if they can't hit the hard target, and then uh, and the big guys will miss the hard targets as well, just one or two here and there. So I like people to enjoy themselves. Mm-hmm. So it's we I always we're in the leisure industry and we're in the inter- entertainment industry. So I want the guys to be entertained. So I try to keep the scores, the lower scores up as well. I don't want them going home demoralized and thinking, oh, I don't want to go shooting again. Yeah. So you try to keep what, like a, a 50% on the, maybe the, the least qualified shooter. You want him to shoot at least 50%. Yeah. And on my targets, I like to try and have them doing something. So if you relax, you may miss one on the stand. I want them doing d- d- twisting and turning. So if you're not paying attention, you can miss one. So if, if you've got a 12 station layout, you miss one uh, uh, stand, you're shooting an 88. Right. And you actually feel you haven't shot that badly. Now, what makes a good target setter in your opinion? Uh, I, I, I would think you've got to know your traps and you know, and you've got to know where you're going to put your traps. And, and I always like to have a plan and basically, and looking where I'm going to put my traps is, yeah. is quite thing for me what do you like to set more sometimes the slower ones <laughs> i did a target we did a uh, up in north yorkshire at ej churchill's at swinton i did a shoot there two weeks ago and i've got like a little bank it's probably about 50 feet high and uh the tr- is the, the bottom of the bank's probably about 45 feet away from you from the stand yeah and i had a target with a trainer spring going up the bank and they couldn't hit it and it was hardly any spring on it at all so it, and they were they all stood there trying to work out what they needed to do with this target so sometimes the slower ones do catch them out just as much as the fast ones yeah i agree with that the, the rick hemingway i know you know rick he's he is known for those he'll throw a flopper on you in a quick in a minute it makes it hard it's, for sure the, the slow ones i like to try like to different speed changes catch people out you have a, a fast one going across and then you have a slow one and just catch them out with their gun swing Mm-hmm. So they shoot. So, what do you consider when you're setting a world championship course? Balance. So just you've got to. I always try to get 
try and tick every but target you can in the box. So I know in the US you don't shoot as much driven, but try and get a driven in, an overhead, crosses, quarters, just a bit of everything. And try and get a balance so you're not favouritism certain shooter because he shoots that style. You're trying to give him a balance so every shooter's got a chance. You know, when, when setting a course for such an event that people attend from all over the world, what is it that you try to achieve? Is it you try to achieve the targets that they're used to seeing in their country, maybe? Or is it? Well, I look at the topography. If we got really good topography, I did the European with uh, Patrick Russo, uh, and it was another course design. We did the, the European in Gant in Hungary, and we did it in these quarries. And we, we put the traps up at the top of the quarries and we're firing them down and firing off the top. And so, some of the targets were spectacular. It was just, it, we, you use what you've got. What do you enjoy setting more, a FITAS layout or a sporting course? Well, I do like, love doing FITAS and uh, I do like my English sport. And, and I've really, uh, in the UK, we don't shoot a lot of compact. And through the winter, I've been doing a compact at EJ Churchill's. And that's been good fun setting that as well. Because every, just, I just like people when they finish shooting with a smile on their face. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you still shoot? Are you shooting? Do you have time to shoot? Not really. Occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. We throw the EJ Churchill's. It's, uh, we don't get chance, especially in the summer. I do, I do a bit of game shooting in the winter, which I enjoy. Now, Mark Windsor also is at EJ Churchill, right? One of them. Yes, he is. He's based up our North, uh, shooting ground at Swinton. Okay. Now do you, when you set a course, do you shoot the course occasionally? Okay. Or I get, I, I try and get two other people. I like maybe a, a, a really good shot and a, an average shot, go and shoot the course. And then we walk around and then you can tweak it if you need to. I know you're at right now, you're at West side sporting grounds in Houston, Texas. Tell me what you're doing there. Yeah, I'm doing a target setting clinic. Uh, we've got, we've had five guys in the last couple of days and I've got seven guys in for the next few days. And uh, we've been, I've been showing them trap safety and working on traps and how to do stuff with uh, with traps. And then uh, we've been building the course, and I've been asking their ideas, and they've been following and I'm saying, right, this I wouldn't do that because, of, from my experience, if it's gone wrong, and say that's a better idea to do this, and it proved really popular. The 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 last the the group today were really happy when they left. Kind of go through what you do. At, at this target setting clinic or, or courses, whatever you want to call it. Tell me what, how, how did people get signed up and how do you, you know, what, what do you do? Well, was Will Fennell approached me when I was at Providence Hill Farm and he said, would you, or would I be interested in coming over and doing some clinics? And I said, yeah, but because of the pandemic, uh, it was put on hold for a little while. Will phoned me in January and said, uh, am I still interested? And uh, I said, yeah, I said, I'm all over to good at some ideas. And then uh, Dan Daniels uh, called me and we got chatting and I said, well, I can come over in March. I said, it, it, for EJ Churchill's, it really starts ramping up in, uh, in April. So I said, I've got uh, like a bit of a uh, space in my diary. So I've come over and we basically planned out. We got, we do, we start off with some trap maintenance and trap safety. And we talk about the traps and what they do and the angles and what, which is the best angle the trap works at and where it, I'd show them which is the best angles that you won't get no birds and different little, little tricks I do with the trap. And then we go out on the course and we walk around the course and we design the course, like what I, how I would do at a big shoot and draw it all up. And then tr we try to get it balanced. So you look at, you've got too many incomers, too many left to rights or right to lefts, and you plan it all out. And then day two, we go and build the course. Yeah. How do you plan out a course? Well, I, beforehand, I always go, if, I, if I'm doing the welfare tash, I will go to the ground and then have a good, it takes me probably a day, maybe two days, just walking the ground. And I'll find all the locations I want for the pegs. Mm -hmm. And then for the next two days, I go to each location and draw up the plan I want and where I want the machines and what type of machine I want to put there. So it takes you a, a few days just to do that before you start even setting anything. Yeah, and that's we, we draw it all up in the paths and where we're going to take the path through. And I like sometimes to go off track and put some pegs in some. And you find the best spot that it's like an opening in the woods, and you go, well, I'll put a layout in here. Yeah. And, uh, what kind of people do you see attending your 
your clinics or your courses? Is it shooter, uh, shooters, club owners? What, what kind of what people are attending? Uh, both. We've had uh, the last couple of days with some shooters, and, and then we've had a couple of range owners. So, yeah, the, this is a new project for us. So we're seeing how it goes, and I've got some uh, some guys down with who are up from Michigan, and they were range owners, and they're here tomorrow. And then we've got some shooters as well. So do you feel that the shooters that are coming are wanting to be tra- target setters, or are they just wanting to understand how the targets work? What do you think? Yeah, they basically want to know how the targets, uh, the target set works, and they're interested in how you set a course. And the funny, they said we didn't realize it is how much work goes into setting a course. I told somebody one time I wanted to set a course, and they said, "No, you don't." So I just quit talking about it. It's a it's, <laughs> it's a ton of work from what they were saying. It's a it's a lot to think about, and that they were they were a bit uh, it blew their minds a bit. And when what we had to look at for safety and where we were putting the trap, and we look at from each shooting location, we can't see the targets from the next stand, and where we're going to put the machines, and there's it, it, a lot to think about for them. And they they, they were yeah, a bit taken back by the, how much work's involved. Talk about shot fall, because you hear that all the time on courses. How do you yeah. gauge the shot fall? How do you if you're setting a course? How do you know where that's going to be? Roughly, I. <laughs> If you're over t- 250 yards or, t- say, 280 yards, uh, you're pretty much all right for shot fall. You probably wouldn't go much further. They say 300, 300 yards and you're comfortable. Okay. So that's f- for every stand you shoot, you have to be, whatever way you're shooting, you have to be 300 yards away from the next stand. For, uh, oh, sorry. No, from the distance from the, the when you're shooting away. If you're going to shoot, if I'm... I try not to get the stands too close. I don't, I don't like seeing the targets from the next stand. So if I can give myself enough room or I use some trees as a screen, I, I, I use that. Driven targets, which we don't see a lot of over here. We see some. Doug Vine said a couple of them before. But driven targets, you have to worry about the target falling you know, after you shoot yeah. it when, when it's coming to you. How much room do you have to allow for that? Well, yeah, I, I always try, if I've got a wood behind me, to get the clays land in the wood. So you're not, yeah. there's no paths. So you got you have to really be, really quite look at it quite, uh, <clears throat> and you keep the path quite narrow from uh, from the debris. So you're coming over here. But you're also going to be setting the fee task on at Georgia State. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I've got chatting to to Jimmy Warren, and he uh, <laughs> asked to be interested in coming over to the Big Red Oak to do the fee task. I said I would. So I'm looking forward to it. Have you ever been to Big Red Oak? I haven't, no. Okay. Just, uh, a friend of mine, Randy Javalia, he's mentioned it and said there's a lot of land there to, to work with, and it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of people are talking about it and excited that you're coming. So um, now I want to talk about something that I heard. I want to see, I want to hear your story about it. I heard you drive a tank around. Yeah. I, when I was, when, when my father had self down, we got into the, we were doing some corporate entertainment, and a friend of mine bought some tanks. And he he bought the tank that was in one of the James Bond movies. <laughs> so we we had a bit of fun with that. And what what did I mean? What, what did you just drive it? Or, what did you do with it? Uh, we used to take people, and they used to stand in the in the top, and we said they used to pay for us to drive them around. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you, did you drive it through town? What I mean, you just drive it around the, the gun club. What'd you do with it? And it was just on the ground. It was on the South Downs, and we used to drive it around there. We had about six, about five, six hundred acres, so we used to drive it around the around the farm. Did you ever, did you ever shoot it? Uh, no, we didn't. No, I've got, I've got a good story about Will. All right. So we took lamping one night when he was over a few years ago, and uh, he shot his first wood pigeon off the back of uh, a vehicle with a shotgun lamping, and uh, I lamped up a rabbit, and then I heard a pigeon. He shot the rabbit, and then no, a pigeon got out the trees, and I spotlighted the pigeon, and he shot the pigeon as well. So, yeah, we we were all laughing about that. And you call it lamping? Yeah, so with a spotlight at okay. night. And what we do, we drive around on a vehicle, and you stand on the back of the vehicle shooting with a shotgun off the back. I don't know how Will kept his balance standing in the back of a vehicle. Yeah, the vehicle was way down at the back quite a bit. <laughs> Well, Will's got a lot of good things to say about you for sure. I know he's he talks really well about you. I'm sure he's he's fun to go out with and shoot and hunt and 
Good yeah. God, Will. There's one thing about Will. If you got stuck in that truck you're talking about while you're hunting, you just put him in the back and it'll get all the traction you need to get out of the mud hole. <laughs> yeah, we didn't get stuck with Will in the back. <laughs> So, are, are you planning on doing this clinic, this target setting clinic, anywhere else in the U.S.? Or are you planning on coming back and doing it somewhere else? Yeah, we're looking. Uh, we're seeing how this one goes, and we're looking at to do some other places as well. So, I think we're on to something, and it'd be quite interesting to do some more. I think it's cool to bring it, bring uh, someone in that's from that's been around the whole world and seen targets everywhere, and bring them in to show how they show them how they set targets. You know, Greece, UK, wherever it is that you're that you're used to setting targets. I think it's neat to bring that over here and, and show people what you know for sure. I always liked, uh, when I've traveled, I've always kept an open opinion on things and uh, never really sort of bamboozled things, like shot things down. If, it's, if it looks good, I'll use that. Now, is your dad, is he still doing any any of this with you? Is What, what is he doing? Yeah, he's got a little shoot uh, where not far where I live, and he does a shoot once a month, and uh, he goes up the... He, got his quad bike and he goes up the woods and moves traps around and he just keeps himself busy he loves still being involved in in the clay shooting side and he sometimes comes and helps me at ej churchill's yeah now what was what did he set i know he said a lot of good stuff too what did he set back in the when he was really doing it yeah he shot uh, set quite a few world englishes he set uh well fit ashes british opens uh, he said come and set a few u.s opens and he was in, he did some shoots in Texas as well. I think he did some shoots at the American Shooting Center, uh, West Side, and he went to there were some other places in Texas. How how, did, how have you seen it evolve from working with him back when he did it to now? How have you seen this sport evolve? Well, yeah, it's got bigger, and there's a lot more uh, going on, and the, the equipment's got better. Uh, when we were started, the traps were in their infancy. They were pretty basic, the automatic traps, and we had uh, pull cords to fire them. And now we've got all these radio releases and flush radios and claymate. It's uh, it's moved on in that way. You know what's what's also what to add to that? The talent of the shooters is what is blows my mind. I don't care oh. if you set targets. If you set if you're out in Texas right now and you set one that lands in Oklahoma, they're gonna hit it somehow. And I don't understand how they do it. Well, yeah, them guys now, if it's within 60 yards, they're going to hit it, and they're not they are not going to miss it very often. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, there's no point trying to beat them with distance to shoot it out of range because all you do is penalise the other guys. It's just <laughs> these guys have big scores now. So if it's there, they're going to hit it. What would you say is the most difficult target to hit for yourself? Well, I, I'm not, I don't like the overhead going away. So that's always been my nemesis. But I, I love shooting driven. Uh, really, that's I've spent a lot of time practicing, and that's really what I like. I enjoy shooting. So you like them coming to you, just not going away from you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to mention uh, West Side. Yeah. Tell me about. I've never been to West Side Sporting Grounds. Okay, so tell me about the place. I want to go there. I'm probably going to go there next year when I go out to nationals, or this year when I go to nationals. Tell me about that place and how nice it is. It's, it's a beautiful ground, and uh, it's a very well-run ground. I was working with their staff today, and they're very efficient, and uh, and everything's immaculate, well-presented. Uh, all the cages are in the right spot, and shooting cages. Uh, sorry, the the gun racks, and it's just everything is it's detention to detail. And uh, what I like here as well is hardly any no birds. You press a button, everything works. Isn't something going to be at EJ Tur- EJ Churchill this year? Yeah, we've got the uh, we've got the Bretter Worlds on, and we've got the British Grand Prix Compact, and we're doing up in our uh, north uh, up at Yorkshire with at Swinton. We're doing the Bretter Grand Prix. Sorry, the Pratsy Grand Prix. And are you setting any of this? Yeah, I'm doing doing all of them. Wow, that's that's amazing. But uh, tell me how if someone wants to get in touch with you about taking this clinic with you about target setting how do they get in touch with you and what do they need to do well if i've given my email address and it's uh james.peckham at ejchurchill.com there you go if anybody's interested get get a hold of him and and see if we can get you in the course I had an interesting uh, phone call from john francois palancas 
uh, he's he's asked me if I go and help in Italy at the World Fit Ash in the summer. So I just need to get back to him if I'm available. I've just got to look at my diary. I'll be working with Sparda, who's another uh, target setter. He's the Italian guy, and it's his shooting ground. And he, he's got, I feel quite obliged. He's 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 asked me to go and help him. So I've, I feel I was quite taken back by that. And what's your goals for the future? Oh, I, I just it's my passion, and I love doing it. So it's not, I don't look. I, it, I I like getting up in the morning and doing this. So uh, it's, see how it goes. Yeah. You just. I, with the me being an official target for Fitash, I've got many years to go with that. I can be. Uh, How old are you, Jamie? I'm 48. Okay. Yeah, you've got a long ways to go. I'm I'm excited about seeing your targets over here at Georgia and at Georgia State, and I think it's cool. I'm gonna come up and talk to you and maybe pick your brain about what you've done, and we'll go from there. But I I've, I've enjoyed talking to you, but I appreciate you coming on and sharing what you have with us, and look forward to meeting you. Great, yeah, thank you for having me, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you. All right, Jamie, thank you for joining me.